Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians is a book that was written to the people in Philippi. Uh, if you are familiar with it, that is also the place where Paul and Silas were thrown in jail and where they had the Philippian jailer and led him and his family to the Lord. And it's also the place where he met a woman who was a trader in the purple cloth industry. There was also a woman there who was a lady who gave out cloth and stuff to the poor. If you remember that, where she was brought back to life by Paul and them as well. And this is the place Paul is writing to. This is also the church that, even though that they didn't have much, they continued to send gifts to him and to continue to help him out financially, sometimes or just with any other need that he might have had. This is a church that was small, but they did minister to others. And it's also a place that Paul's writing to. And he's excited and telling them to continue to rejoice in the Lord and to continue to work and serve God. And so we pick up here in Philippians chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 4 where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Um, Many times when we hear the word rejoice, we think of happiness, or we think of joy, or we think something along those lines. But these other words... This word also has other things that can go along with it. Uh, It has words such as peace can be associated with rejoice. Words such as praise or thanksgiving can be associated with rejoice. And my proposition to you this afternoon is God wants you to rejoice. He wants you to. Uh, But how can you do that? You can do that in three different ways found in this section of Scripture, these Verses in Philippians 4, and the first one is, is you must learn to let your moderation be known to men. And and moderation here, a lot of times the first definition that comes to your mind is um, control. It's it's not going into excess, it's controlling what you consume or controlling how much you do something or controlling your desires. It's a a small amount, you don't go in excess, You, you control how you go. But the idea of this word also has the idea of kindness and gentleness and patience. Uh, this word can be looked at differently if you translate it. It can also be translated with this meaning of kindness and gentleness, which it, it spreads, it broadens the meaning of the understanding here for this verse. And so he's saying in verse four, or verse 5, and he says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So he's telling us to rejoice, and then the first thing following that is moderation. Let it be known. He's asking, and he's saying, let your kindness, your gentleness be known of all men, and also your self-control as well. Let it be known to all men. But why would he say that? Why would that be important to let men see your gentleness and your self-control and your patience? Uh, There are many reasons why that's important. When men see your gentleness or kindness, that opens up doors for them to listen to you for the gospel. It opens the door for you to minister to them. It opens up the door for you just to serve God. It's an opportunity for you to be a blessing to someone, to show the servitude that Christ has asked us to show to others. But at the same time, it also shows them Christ. For he was a man who was gentle, and he was a man who was kind, and he was a man who had self-control. And it shows them who he was, and it shows them who you are, that you're one of his followers. It gives you the opportunity to share with him. And the reason being for all of this is the very next statement he makes. It says, the Lord is at hand. This implies that he's coming soon. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't give a specific time, but it's saying that he's coming soon. And, and what is being said there is you want to be found doing as Christ has asked you to do. You want to be found serving as Christ has asked you to serve. You, he wants you to be found sharing his word. He wants you to be found being gentle to others, being kind to others, being in self-control of yourself. 
He wants you to be found that way, and he's saying rejoice in that, and that's the way you can rejoice. You can rejoice in gentleness and in kindness and in self-control because if you have self-control, you can enjoy different activities. You can enjoy your, your life. You can enjoy different foods and stuff because how many times have we at one point or another in our lives overeaten and we just feel kind of sick? You didn't really enjoy the food after that, did you? Uh, none of us really enjoy having an upset stomach. Um, think about... Um, uh, sports, if you overindulge in sports, they kind of just get a routine and it loses its attraction. It doesn't have the excitement to it anymore. Think of anything that you can do, and if you go beyond it in moderation, you don't control yourself with how much you enjoy or participate in that activity, it can get, you can overexert yourself, you can get stressed, you can get wore out and tired. That self-control to control yourself, but then on the flip side, gentleness and kindness, showing that and being as like Christ, it shows that you've been obeying him. We think about it this morning. We talked about love thy neighbor as yourself, where in Galatians, Paul talks about that. Loving your neighbor is showing them gentleness and kindness. And so through that, we can rejoice. We can rejoice in knowing that we're serving God. We can rejoice in knowing that we're being like Christ, that we're growing in Christ. We can have that joy of serving him and knowing that we're living in obedience to him. But that's not the only thing that he talks about. Uh, if you move on into the next few verses, you so we want to rejoice, and God wants us to rejoice, and you can do that through letting your moderation be known to all men. But he also wants to rejoice in us giving thanks. If you look at verse 6 with me, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So, you must give thanks to God. That's a way of rejoicing. Uh, we just had our praise time earlier in a way of praising God and giving thanks for who He is and what He's done to us, done for us and to us. And so, by giving that thanks, it gives us a joy, it gives us a peace, it gives us comfort, and that's a way we can rejoice and rejoice in God is by giving thanks to him. And this thanks can be done through prayer. That's a, a very major way, a big way in how we praise God and give thanks to him is through prayer. Bringing our needs to him is one thing. That, that, that prayer is not only to give him praise and give him thanks, it's to bring our needs because he has promised to meet our needs. So when we bring them to him, and we have that knowledge, and we know that he's promised to meet our needs, that allows us to give thanks and to rejoice in God because he's a God who has a cattle on a thousand hills. And if you know anything about having cattle on a thousand hills, let's think about a small hill the size of a stage, but there's a thousand of them with cows on them. It, that's a lot of wealth, especially during that time. That was a lot of wealth. That would be like saying today you had billions and billions of dollars. That's a lot of wealth. And he has the means to supply our, for our needs. But then supplications, those are requests, praying for others' needs, praying for, even praying for your wants or asking for things. That's making known your requests to God. And we are to do that in thanksgiving. And the reason being, again, because he's done so much for us. He's given us salvation. He provides for us. He's a God who protects us and watches over us. He's a God who cares for us. And that's a reason and a good way to give thanks is just to pray for him and give him the supplications that we have in our hearts. But why would we go to God with thanksgiving? Why would we do that? And if you look back in verse 7, he talks about that. And he says, he says there in verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. We give thanks because by giving thanks to God, it's a reminder of us of who he is and what he can do. And that peace provides comfort, that comfort and peace. That's what you, you obtain when you pray to God and you're giving thanks to him because if you're giving thanks to him, you have to have a reason for be giving him that thanks. Your thanks for his compassion, his thanks for his mercy, his salvation, whatever he's done for you in your life, whether it's provide food or money or a house or clothing, whatever it may be, if you're giving thanks, you're obviously giving thanks for something, and that reminds you of who he is, of his characteristics, 
of what he has done. And that gives you a, a peace of mind, peace of heart. If you think about it, when you pray to God and you say, God, I thank you for that last paycheck. It was exactly what I needed to pay my bills so I can keep living here and, and having electricity and having water and having whatever we may have. It gives you a comfort and peace. But not only does God want us to rejoice in through letting our moderation be known to men, and not only through giving thanks to him, but he also wants us to rejoice by thinking on the elements of God. If you look with me in verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so he lists uh, some things to think on, some things to, some elements of God to think on. He says, list, think on the things that are true, on truth, God's word. Uh, think on those things. Let that be in your mind. Let it fill up your thoughts and let it go through your life and have its, its effect in your life. Let that truth affect the way you live and how you act. And then he's saying also on those things that are honest, those things that aren't meant to deceive others, things that are, are for our lack of a better word, true. Uh, the facts, those things that are, are there and there's no, gu- no guile in them, nothing to deceive, nothing to hurt or lie to. And then he goes on to say and those things that are pure, those things that are, are holy, those things that are not corrupted, and then those things that are lovely, those things that are nice, that haven't been tainted or marred or, or scarred in such a way that it's not good to look at. There are things that we can look at that aren't pure. Uh, it's like, uh, there's pictures, there's certain certain people that you can look at with the way they dress, just the way you look at things, how you look at things, those things that aren't pure, that do not represent or honor Christ. And then those things of good report, those things that have a good reputation, those things that don't have negative or sinful things connotated with it, that it's good report, has a good reputation, there's nothing bad about it when you think of it. And so what, are the, what is the, the reason for thinking on these things? He goes and he says, you know, think on these things. And he, and he says, so, and he's like, also, he, he lists two more he, besides thinking on those. He says, any virtue, those things that are a good, that have honor to it, and those things that are be any praise, the things that you can praise God for. And he says in verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. He wants you to have your thought life concerned with these things. He wants you to be concerned with the, his word. Think on God's word. Have that fill your thought life. If you're thinking on the things of God, you're not going to be thinking on things that are dishonest, that are of lies. You're not going to be thinking on the things that have no purity to them, that aren't lovely, that don't have any good report, that have bad report. Uh, you're going to be thinking on things that have virtue and things that have praise. You're going to be thinking on these elements. And these elements are elements of God's characteristics. And these are elements of God himself. He wants you to think on these things and the reason being is because, first of all, you've learned these things. And if you've ever learned something and then quit thinking on it, you have realized pretty quickly how that just kind of disappears from your, your mind. Uh, for example, this is not something necessarily pure, but calculus. I've taken three different classes on calculus. You asked me to do that right now, I probably will not be able to do it because I don't practice doing that quite often, honestly speaking. Uh, but if you don't practice something continually, if you're not thinking about it continually, it's very hard for you to retain that because you don't see a need to. It's not important to you to retain. And then he, the reason he wants you to do that is because you've learned it and you've received it. And he wants you to hold on to it because Satan wants to take away those things from us. He doesn't want us to hold on to those truths. He doesn't want us to hold on to what we've learned about God. He wants us to forget because if we forget that God is our protector, that God is the one who comforts us, when a trial comes or where something bad goes wrong in our life, we tend to stress out and we worry and we start looking everywhere else. But God, knowing that God's the only one that can help us, and he wants to take those things away from us. And he says, those things that you've seen in me, that example that I've lived out for you of, of doing right, but it's not so much what he's done, but it's the things that they've seen in him that God has done in his life. 
Think of Paul said that he had some thorn in his side. And the guess is that it was some physical deformity that he had or something wrong with his, his eyes or something along those lines. And they saw how God worked in his life. They saw what God has done in his life and how God's worked through him and used him. And they saw that, and he's saying, do those things. He's saying, learn the things of God and receive the things of God. Don't just learn it. Make it a part of who you are and of your life and your actions and those things that you've heard. Don't just, you've heard them and you've seen them. So do those things. Do those things of God, sharing the word of God, sharing that moderation, that self-control, that kindness, that gentleness. Share the praise, the thanksgiving for God. Share your supplications. He's wanting you to think on those things so that when you're thinking on them, you can pray about them. You can praise God for them. You can thank God for them. And you can also share it with other people around you and that you can also be an example for other people. And he says, and if these things are in your life, if you are praying to God, if you are having that moderation, that gentleness, that self-control, and you are giving thanks, and you are thinking on those things that are true, those things that are honest, those things that are pure and lovely, and those things that are good report, and those that have virtue, and those things that are worthy of praising God for, then you'll have the God of peace shall be with you. The more you talk with somebody, the more time you spend with them, the more time they spend with you. Think about in a relationship with somebody, whether it be a friend or if you're married or anything along those lines, siblings, the more you talk with someone and spend that time with them, how much time do they spend with you? They, they, they spend more time with you as well. Because to spend time with them, they have to be present, right? They have to be there in order for you to spend time with them and to talk with them. Well, now we have cell phones, but we're going to leave that aside. The idea is you're talking with someone, spending time with somebody. And so when he says the God of peace shall be with you, that's like a right there. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense now. It's, it's an obvious statement because if you're praying to God, obviously he's there. If you're giving thanks to God, he's there. If you're showing gentleness and you're showing self-control, that's part of the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about this morning. That's part of the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in you. So he has to be there to produce that, that fruit. And so for all of these things to happen, God has to be there to begin with. So when he says, and the God of peace shall be with you, that's like a no-duh statement. It's like an obvious statement because God has to be there for the rest of that to be true. And he wants you to rejoice. He wants you to have, he wants you to, have that contentment and that peace and that rejoicing, and that rejoicing comes through having the God of peace with you. And if these things are present in your life, you're allowing the Holy Spirit to produce these things in your life. If you're thinking on the Word of God and dwelling on the Word of God, allowing it to affect your life, and you're living that out, and you're allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you and walk you along in life to do these things, God of peace will be with you. He will be with you. And so... God wants us to rejoice and through the moderation, through the thanksgiving, and through the elements of him, which include the true, honest, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, and praise with those things. And so I want to ask you, will you rejoice? Will you think on the things of God? Will you think on those things that are true and honest and pure and lovely and of good report? Will you find things that have virtue and things that are worthy of praise? Will you think on those things? Will you allow your life to be filled with moderation, self-control, and gentleness? Will you go to God with your needs and also with your requests for the needs of others? So will you rejoice? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to just show them that you give us joy and that you have uh, give us every reason to rejoice. And because of you, we have everything we will ever need, Lord. And I want to thank you for all of that, Lord. I want to thank you for everything you do in our life. In your name I pray. Amen.